Thanks to Audible for keeping Legal Eagle in the air. Oh my gosh, I have so much work to do today. Well, let me read one more article by the mainstream media fake news before I get started. Testimony torpedoes Republican defenses of Trump. Trump's defenses are almost entirely gone. Trump has no defense after Sondland testimony. That can't be right. Can it? Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer because Republican and Democratic positions on this whole impeachment hearing have been changing over time. And I think it's worthwhile going over the Republican impeachment defenses to see if they hold any legal water. Quick disclaimer, of course, uh, the facts are fluid and they are changing. Multiple witnesses are testifying every week. So some of the factual issues here that I'm going to discuss, I'm sure are going to change. But I wanted to take some time to focus on some of the legal issues that are implicated by these impeachment hearings. I'm going to try to do my best to steel man these arguments. In other words, I'm going to try to give the Republican defenses in the best light possible to avoid uh, attacking straw men and dealing with the best possible version of those particular defenses. Some of these defenses are better than others. It's a bit of a moving target though, because different Republicans have focused on different defenses. There isn't exactly a unified front on this. But that being said, let's dig into the main defenses that Republicans are using in this impeachment inquiry. So the first impeachment defense probably boils down to no quid pro quo, or in other words, the call was perfect. There's a rumor out they want the first conversation. It was beautiful. It was just a perfect conversation. This is largely the preferred defense of President Trump in that he tends to tweet this out with some frequency. This also appeared to be the early favored defense of the Republicans that has largely evaporated. You still see it a little bit, but it's not the favored uh, defense at the time. The argument is that as a factual matter, there was no quid pro quo between the United States and Ukraine. I didn't do it. There was no quid pro quo. Senators and all of these other people have actually done what they're accusing me of doing, which I didn't do. As the president often tweets out and says in public, read the transcript. Whether you believe that the transcript is sufficient to show a quid pro quo evidencing a solicitation of a bribe, or whether you believe that the transcript demonstrates that the call was in fact perfect, as the president says, is a factual matter for you to decide. And a variation of this argument was used in the questioning of Lieutenant Colonel Vindman by Representative Ratcliffe, who pointed out that no witness in the depositions uh, as part of the impeachment inquiry had ever used the word bribery. In an impeachment inquiry that the Speaker of the House House says is all about bribery, where bribery is the impeachable offense, no witness has used the word bribery to describe President Trump's conduct. None of them. Instead, that witnesses had used the phrase quid pro quo. Bribery is the ultimate conclusion. In other words, it is a legal conclusion that the Democrats are attempting to prove if the analogy to being a prosecutor holds. And it would be improper to ask the fact witnesses about an ultimate legal conclusion. That's not what fact witnesses are for. And while reasonable minds can differ about the conclusions that one draws from the facts that have been elicited thus far, and I leave it to you as to uh, where you think the facts are going, this particular case. It does seem like most Republicans are pivoting away from the argument that there is no quid pro quo at all, because to believe that argument, you would have to believe that most of the witnesses that have testified so far are lying, including uh, Yovanovitch, Sondland, Holmes, Williams, Taylor, Volker, Kent, Hill, Vindman, and John friggin Bolton. Uh, they're all liars in this particular case. And that's a hard argument to make, which is why it seems to appear that most Republicans have moved on from no quid pro quo to no illegal or impeachable quid pro quo. In fact, even Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney said in a, the last press conference that he gave that there was in fact a quid pro quo and that quid pro quos happen all the time. We do that all the time with foreign policy. And in fact, that this particular quid pro quo was conditioned partially on an investigation into the Bidens. Gordon Sondland said, in his testimony that there was in fact an explicit quid pro quo. He straight out said it. Was there a quid pro quo? As I testified previously, with regard to the requested White House call and the White House meeting, the answer is yes. Now, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy takes a slightly more nuanced path when he argued that the Ukrainians got everything that they wanted, so there was no quid pro quo. That's not exactly the same thing as arguing that there was no quid pro quo, except to say that 
there was no ultimate uh, transfer of a thing of value, which is a slightly different argument that we'll get to in just a second. Ben Shapiro points out an interesting nuance on Twitter when he says, the question for Sondland today isn't whether Trump withheld aid in exchange for investigations. We already knew that. The question is whether Trump's intent was to get Biden in anticipation of 2020 or to investigate 2016 activities out of concern for corruption, even if the latter was based on bad information and conspiracism promoted by Giuliani. And this is true in a criminal prosecution sense. I, I don't often agree with Ben Shapiro, but I think this is an interesting, if nuanced point that deals with the mens rea defense uh, to impeachment, which we'll talk about in just a second. But I do want to drop a footnote that I want you to think about, which is that it's not an either or proposition that the president's motivation was either to get dirt on the Bidens for his own personal gain or to investigate corruption in Ukraine. It's not necessarily the case that he had had only one motivation. And the legal implications of this mixed potential motive are very, very interesting. And that brings me to the next argument. It's all hearsay. The Trump administration and its supporters have been fairly consistent in arguing that the evidence that's been elicited so far has been hearsay testimony in that it relies on out of court statements. It's all hearsay. You can't get a parking ticket conviction based on hearsay. The whistleblower didn't hear the phone call. Now I have done an entire video on the nature of hearsay evidence as it regards these impeachment hearings. Uh, but suffice it to say, while there is a grain of truth in these arguments, just because something is hearsay doesn't mean it's number one, admissible and number two, bad evidence. And the public shorthand of thinking of hearsay evidence as being second and third hand information is not necessarily uh, coextensive with the legal definition and often hearsay is powerful evidence. And it depends on the particular circumstances, whether particular evidence, uh, particularly hearsay evidence is good evidence or bad evidence. It depends on whether that evidence is corroborated. It depends on the nature of the circumstances themselves. And it depends on whether the circumstances would allow that hearsay evidence in or not. Now, uh, there are arguments to be made that to the extent the information is hearsay, th there are all kinds of exceptions to the hearsay rule that are used in every day in court to allow that information to be admitted into evidence. Sometimes hearsay evidence is incredibly strong. I would argue that things like business records in the form of emails or video or uh, uh, testimony of the accused who admits to a crime, all of which are considered hearsay, but are admissible in court because they are very strong pieces of evidence. But but admittedly, sometimes hearsay is particularly weak. It depends on the nature of the evidence and the nature of the circumstances in that particular case. Now, I will point out that in these proceedings, there's a bit of what lawyers would call an unclean hands problem in that the people who have firsthand knowledge of what the president said and what the president did uh, are being prevented from testifying in these proceedings. And I think the Democrats would argue that for example, if the mob intimidates a witness into not testifying, that member of the mob shouldn't be able to then argue about the lack of witnesses uh, be testifying against them. And as Neil Katyal has argued on Twitter, the only reason that we don't have the firsthand knowledge witnesses is because Trump blocked them from testifying. That itself is impeachable. And as time goes on, perhaps we will get more testimony from those individuals who had firsthand knowledge of the actual instructions that President Trump may or may not have given. And on November 20th, uh, Gordon Sondland, who did have some uh, firsthand interactions with the president and firsthand knowledge of the events described, did testify that apparently the entire State Department led by Mike Pompeo and Chief of Staff Mulvaney did know about the explicit quid pro quo. You've testified and that Mulvaney was aware of this quid pro quo, of this condition that the Ukrainians had to meet, that is announcing these public investigations to get the White House meeting. Is that right? Yeah, a lot of people were aware of it. Um, and In including, about, including Mr. Mulvaney. Correct. Which brings me to the next big defense, which is that the aid, the military and financial aid that was allegedly conditioned on investigations into the Bidens was in fact released, or for short, the Sideshow Bob defense. This is the defense that was made famous by the Simpsons in arguing that attempted crime is not really a crime. Convicted of a crime I didn't even commit. <laughs> Attempted murder. Now, honestly, what is that? Do they give a Nobel Prize for attempted chemistry, do they? 
I know this may come as news to many of you out there, but attempted crime is in fact a crime. And unfortunately for many of you, uh, next time you are pulled over by the police, you can't try to get out of it by offering the police a bribe and then claim that it wasn't attempted bribery because the police officer didn't accept the bribe that you offered. That will get you in a lot of trouble, hashtag not legal advice. Now, I think most people intuitively understand that attempted crime is still in fact a crime in and of itself, but this argument in particular in the context of bribery makes absolutely no sense. Solicitation of a bribe is a federal crime under 18 USC 201, particularly subsection B2. Federal bribery occurs when a public official seeks a thing of value in exchange for some official act or duty. It doesn't rely on the person who is the target of the solicitation actually giving the uh, politician in question the thing of value. It's all in the ask. Arguably, there isn't such a thing as attempted solicitation of bribery in the context of someone who has asked for a bribe. In that particular case, the act has been consummated. There's no attempt. There is an actual violation of the law. So here, the argument is that President Trump sought an investigation into a political rival in exchange for releasing a hold on funds that Congress appropriated. Punctuated in the Zelensky transcript readout, where President Trump talks about the aid and then says, I would like you to do us a favor though. Along those lines, Nikki Haley says it didn't succeed, so it was absolutely okay. The Ukrainians never did the investigation and the president released the funds. I mean, when you look at those, there's just nothing impeachable there. The main argument being here that because the $400 million in aid was in fact released, that is evidence that there was no conditional hold on it in the first place and therefore no quid pro quo. And it certainly is a potential evidence of that particular argument. The counter argument there is that based on the timeline that the aid was released only after Politico did its famous article on this particular potential quid pro quo, uh, after the whistleblower had already come come forward and after the House had started investigating the whistleblower, that based on that timing, the actual release of the funds uh, is not as exculpatory as uh, the administration may want it to seem. And as far as I know, there doesn't appear to be a strong counter narrative as to why the aid was held in the first place. Gordon Sondland says he reached out to the administration for an answer as to why there was a hold and no one, including up until the present day, ever provided him with a reason for why there was a hold on these Ukrainian funds, uh, which was particularly important because the aid uh, was going to expire at the end of September if it wasn't released based on the congressional budgetary rules. The best defense is that it was somehow related to anti-corruption measures, which we'll talk about in just a second. But that brings me to the next argument, which is that the Ukrainians didn't feel any pressure. This is a slight variation on the aid was released argument. Now, it remains to be seen to what extent the Ukrainians knew or thought that the $400 million in aid was being deliberately withheld on condition of investigations into the Bidens. There are conflicting witnesses on both sides, but I think it's unanimous in that everyone knew that the aid wasn't delivered and that there was some kind of delay on the $400 million in aid. Now, some, including Mick Mulvaney, have argued that the president withheld the aid to ensure that it was put to good use. But uh, it's worth pointing out that the president doesn't have authority to withhold congressionally appropriated funds. The 1974 Congressional Budget and Impoundment Control Act at 31 USC 1512 states that the president can only impound funds under limited circumstances and for no more than 45 days. Because congressional power is at its zenith when you're talking about the budget, congressional appropriations. Congress has the power of the purse. And the funds would have expired if not released by the end of September because of the way that the congressional budget works. The relevant federal budget was passed in September of 2018, a year prior. And in February of 2019, the Trump administration said it was releasing the aid to Ukraine. And it wasn't until almost the entire year after it was passed that the Trump administration actually released the appropriated funds, which I probably don't need to tell you is far longer than the 45 days that the impoundment Control Act allows the president to delay. And as to whether the Ukrainians actually felt the pressure or not, it actually doesn't matter for the crime of bribery. 
Ellie Mistal makes this point in a great article in The Nation, which I will link to below. He talks about the difference between the crime of bribery and the crime of extortion. Bribery, or at least in this case, solicitation for bribery, does not require that the recipient feel any particular pressure. Whereas the crime of extortion does require undue pressure being levied against the victim uh, and that forcing them to do something as a result of that. Which takes me to the next defense, which is too bad to crime, uh, AKA quid amateur quo. In the world of attempt, it doesn't matter if you are stopped beforehand uh, or are so inept as to not be able to actually consummate the criminal act contemplated, or that the victim is unaware that the uh, criminal acts are going on. What matters are whether you have the requisite intent and whether you take a step in furtherance of that particular act. So for example, if you are wearing ski masks with the intent to rob a bank, it doesn't matter if you are arrested before you get to the bank. That's attempted bank robbery. Or if you go into a bank and ask the teller for money at gunpoint and she says no and you don't get any money, that's also attempted bank robbery. So from a criminal law perspective, it doesn't actually matter if you're not good enough or uh, competent enough to actually complete the crime that you are accused of. Uh, what matters is that you attempted to do it and that you had the requisite mens rea or corrupt intent to be able to do it. Of course, as we've discussed in the world of solicitation of bribery, all that's required is that the ask be made. It doesn't actually require that the thing of value that was sought actually be transferred. Uh, there really is no attempt in this particular context. It's the full crime itself. So whether the people who are being accused here are competent enough or not is beside the point, at least as it regards uh, general criminal law. Which brings me to the next defense. The Ukrainians didn't pay up. Uh, this is a variation on the actual crime itself was not completed argument. And this was the focus of Representative Jim Jordan during the questioning of Gordon Sondland on November 20th. Representative Jordan focused on the fact that allegedly uh, President Trump had extorted the Ukrainians to investigate uh, the Bidens and to do an investigation into the crowd strike Ukrainian servers. And he focused on the idea that because the Ukrainians didn't pay up for what was part of the quid pro quo, quo, that therefore there was no underlying crime. You know what a quid pro quo is? I do. This for that, right? Looks to me like Ukraine got that three times and we, there was no this. There was, we, we didn't do anything. Or excuse me, they didn't have to do anything. The argument goes that effectively no harm, no foul, because the Ukrainians got what they wanted and they didn't have to investigate the Bidens. Again, the problem with this argument is that the idea of attempted solicitation of bribery is a little bit inchoate. And the no harm, no foul argument sort of breaks down when you compare it to an analogy to something that we could all agree would be absolutely solicitation for a bribe. So imagine if you had a politician who is on a city council, for example, and says to a local developer, uh, I will approve your project if you give me a million dollars into my bank account. Well, we can all agree that that is solicitation of a bribe. It doesn't actually matter if the developer pays the million dollars uh, or eventually uh, goes to the newspaper, reveals it, and then the uh, development is approved. The fact that the politician asked for a million dollars is the improper act and is the consummation of the crime of solicitation of bribery. And here, Representative Jordan is probably correct that the Ukrainians didn't have to do the ultimate things that were asked of them. The factual evidence appears to show that the Ukrainians were in active talks with the State Department to eventually make an announcement. There were, were negotiations back and forth as to what the announcement was going to say. And during the July 25th call, uh, President Zelensky says that he is going to do it. Effectively, the damage was done and the ask was made. And on November 20th, Gordon Sondland testified that in exchange for the official act of actually releasing the $400 million in aid, the Ukrainians only had to announce investigations into the Bidens. They actually didn't have to do the investigations into the Bidens. I never heard Mr. Goldman, uh, anyone say that the investigations had to start or had to be completed. The only thing I heard from Mr. Giuliani or otherwise was that they had to be announced in some form and that form kept changing. 
Announced publicly? Announced publicly. Now, it's probably worth pointing out that the aid was released only after the Trump administration allegedly got caught. And it's possible that there are other explanations, there could be other evidence here, and that the timing here is only a coincidence. But so far, the White House hasn't really provided that evidence or provided an alternative narrative. All right, that takes us to the no mens rea defense and the variation, the too dumb to crime defense. Now, some crimes have a very specific intent requirement, sometimes called mens rea. In other words, a lot of criminal laws require not only do you do the act that is considered criminal, the actus rea, but you also have to have the mental state that goes along with that particular act. In this particular case, President Trump needs to have had the specific intent to solicit a bribe. Proving mens rea sounds hard. It requires proving the mental state of another person. And oftentimes that is very difficult, but that's also something that the criminal justice system is very, very familiar with. You use the witnesses, other actions and statements to show uh, state of mind. Here, for the most part, I think we're talking about 18 USC 201B2, which is the solicitation of a bribe. Now, the caveat here is, as always, impeachment does not require proving beyond a reasonable doubt that someone committed a crime. The burden for impeachment is not the same as uh, the burden for a criminal prosecution. Impeachment is a political device and high crimes and misdemeanors can often mean whatever Congress says it means. This particular statute does provide a good definition of generally what courts look for in terms of solicitation of a bribe. Now the jury instructions for federal bribery state that at least when you're talking about trying to bribe an official, the defendant must have promised, offered, or given money or thing of value to the public official with the deliberate purpose of influencing an official act of that person. The analogy being that when you're talking about the solicitation of a bribe, it's the other way around. The public official is asking to be influenced in exchange for some other official act. But that is the general mens rea, the intent requirement that a prosecutor would have to show in order to prove solicitation of a bribe. Now here on November 20th, Gordon Sondland said that the president conditioned a White House meeting on the Ukrainians providing the investigation into the Bidens and the Ukrainian crowd strike server. But Sondland also testified that he never heard the specific words that the $400 million in military aid was conditioned on the Biden investigation. He said that was his conclusion from all the instructions that he received from Mick Mulvaney and Mike Pompeo. Now, contrary to what you see on TV, criminals rarely say the actual explicit words that by themselves are sufficient to prove the actual crime. Generally, prosecutors have to prove that with circumstantial evidence. Now, also contrary to what you see on TV, circumstantial evidence can be very, very strong. Uh, DNA evidence is considered circumstantial evidence. And in fact, if this were a criminal prosecution, the jury would get an instruction from the judge that says circumstantial evidence is as strong, if not stronger as direct evidence. And all circumstantial evidence means is something that is not by itself uh, directly sufficient to prove the crime itself, or in this case, the mental state. Now, in this particular case, the circumstantial evidence of the potential mens rea for solicitation of bribery would include the July 25th call with President Zelensky, the July 26th call with Gordon Sondland, the fact that uh, Rudolph Giuliani was uh, a go-between, even though he's not a member of the government, and everything else that was said and done as between Sondland and the members of the State Department. In fact, Gordon Sondland testified that he cleared everything with Mulvaney, Bolton, and Pompeo, and he assumed that if it came from those people, that they came from orders from the president himself. On the other hand, defenders of the administration would point to other circumstantial evidence that they would claim as evidence of uh, lacking the required mens rea uh, to effectuate a solicitation of bribery. And in fact, Gordon Sondland says that after Bill Taylor famously texted, as I said on the phone, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign in a September 9th phone call with the president that potentially raises the questions that Bill Taylor raised. I just asked asked him an open-ended question, Mr. Chairman. What do you want from Ukraine? I keep hearing all these different ideas and theories and this and that. What do you want? And it was a very short, abrupt conversation. He was not in a good mood. And he just said, I want nothing. I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. And while you can argue that the president explicitly saying that he doesn't want a quid pro quo is exculpatory evidence and shows that he lacks the requisite mens rea, you could also argue given the timeline that this actually supports a potential cover up from the president, that given the timeline that the Politico article had already revealed the uh, potentially improper hold on Ukrainian foreign assistance and the fact that even Bill Taylor was saying it was crazy to condition the aid on 
uh, Ukrainians investigating the Bidens that this uh, call and the statement that uh, President Trump made to Gordon Sondland is actually evidence that he was backtracking and trying to cover up his tracks. It can go both ways. That's the issue with circumstantial evidence. It can support one narrative, but it can also support a different narrative as well. And I will leave it to you as to whether you believe the president intended the exchange for his own purpose or for an official purpose of the government. Which brings me to the next potential defense, which is that the president controls foreign policy and it would be improper to impeach him over a foreign policy decision. Now, there is certainly some truth to this. The president has almost all of the power for foreign policy. He is the commander in chief of the armed forces and he controls almost every decision when it comes to foreign policy. Really, Congress has the power to declare war, ratify treaties and appropriate funds when it comes to foreign policy, but that's really about it. The executive is really in control of foreign policy. Now, there is a dispute about whether a constitutionally enumerated power can give rise to a crime or to impeachment. Well, when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal by definition. Exactly. But most constitutional scholars agree that even an official act that is enumerated by the Constitution can give rise to impeachment, if not criminal prosecution. That being said, you would imagine that given that the president has vast foreign policy powers, that you would be very, very reluctant to impeach a president over something that he or she has plenary authority over, in this case, setting foreign policy or removing an ambassador. And there's no doubt that interactions with Ukraine touch on foreign policy power. But just because you have a right doesn't mean that you can escape the repercussions of exercising that right, in the same way that you have a First Amendment right to freedom of speech, but that doesn't absolve you from all of the repercussions of actually using that speech in a specific way. By analogy, consider a hypothetical involving pardons. Now, in the same way that the president has almost unfettered foreign policy power, the president absolutely has unfettered pardon power. It can't be checked by Congress and it can't really be checked by the judiciary either. But if a president started selling pardons for a million dollars a piece, that president could and pretty much by all accounts should be impeached for that kind of action, despite the fact that the president is allowed to pardon people under almost any circumstances. And in fact, one might argue that that president should be criminally prosecuted for solicitation of a bribe. So the fact that this particular instance implicates foreign policy should give everyone pause because the president has wide powers here, but just because the president has wide powers doesn't act to absolve the president of potentially untoward activity. Which brings me to the next defense, which is that the State Department or Gordon Sondland went rogue. I think we're gonna be seeing more of this particular defense in the wake of Gordon Sondland's bombshell testimony. But at base, Gordon Sondland testified that in a few calls he had with the president, he didn't explicitly link releasing the aid with investigations into the Bidens, but that everyone knew that that was what the president wanted. Uh, that was the understanding amongst Pompeo, Volcker, and Sondland, the AKA the three amigos. So potentially those three people could be the fall guys for the administration, saying that it wasn't the president that ordered the conditionality of the Biden investigation on the aid, but rather these State Department officials that went rogue. The argument being that the president didn't order it. If the State Department officials had that understanding, it wasn't an understanding that came from the president and that the State Department and the chief of staff slash the head of the OMB, Mick Mulvaney, effectively went rogue in a a coordinated effort to extract something from the Ukrainians that the president actually didn't want. I will leave it to you if you think that it is more likely that these individuals acted without the knowledge and consent of the president, or whether it was more likely that the president gave orders that were trickled through uh, the secretary of state and chief of staff. Secretary Perry, Ambassador Volker, and I worked with Mr. Rudy Giuliani on Ukraine matters at the express direction of the President of the United States. Now, Gordon Sondland says that when Giuliani gave orders, it was assumed to have come from the President, specifically. When the President says, talk to my personal attorney, and then Mr. Giuliani, as his personal attorney, uh, makes certain requests or demands, we assume it's coming from the President. Now, one issue with this particular defense is that Rudy Giuliani 
didn't have the authority to hold up Ukrainian aid for almost an entire year. That that falls under the purview of the OMB that's led by Mick Mulvaney, which is one reason we would really want to know what people told Mick Mulvaney and why, as well as what was told to Rudy Giuliani and what was spoken between the two of them. Which brings me to the next potential defense. The president has a duty to root out corruption both domestically and abroad. I think that this is probably the main defense that we're going to see going forward. Now, as we've covered, the president controls foreign policy, and there's no doubt that rooting out corruption is intertwined with that mandate to deal with America's foreign policy. Now, based on the evidence that's been elicited so far, I leave it to you as to whether you believe that the president was motivated to uh, root out corruption abroad or whether he was motivated to get dirt on a political rival. But note that people are complicated and it can be both. People can be motivated by multiple different things at the same time. Now, in the criminal world, in terms of mens rea, if there are multiple reasons for committing something, if any one of those mental states is sufficient to uh, meet the standard uh, of mens rea, that's required, that person can be convicted of that particular crime. So the underlying argument is that if there was a basis for the Hunter Biden slash corruption argument, then the president is absolved. But that actually goes the wrong way, at least when you're talking about a, a criminal context. If someone has committed the act that is sufficient for a crime, say bank robbery, and has multiple reasons for doing it, one of which is the mental state that's required for the criminal offense, say bank robbery again, the fact that there are multiple different motivations is irrelevant. If any one part of that motivation is sufficient, that person can be convicted. And again, we would have to go back to not only what the president has said, but what the president has done and what uh, everyone else had done around the president to determine what the president's mental state actually was at the time and whether that was sufficient to prove solicitation of bribery. Now, Kurt Volker testified on November 19th that he saw investigations into Burisma to be separate from the Bidens. Uh, the former being okay, the latter being improper quid pro quo solicitation of bribery. There was no mention of Vice President Biden. Rather, in referencing Burisma and 2016 election interference, it was clear to me that he, Mr. Yermak, was only talking about whether any Ukrainians had acted inappropriately. He concluded that others in the Trump administration saw the two as intertwined and as the same. If that is indeed the case, that could be sufficient to prove a solicitation of bribery. But what could be potentially even more damning in this context and might obviate the corruption defense is that multiple witnesses have testified that President Trump wasn't interested in the investigation into the Biden so much as the announcement of the investigation. As I think Asha Rangappa was the first to point out, this is what's considered black propaganda, propaganda that obfuscates where it came from. The Trump administration wanted the Ukrainians to make an announcement of the investigation into the Bidens and make it look like it had nothing to do with the Trump administration. And on top of that, it doesn't appear that the Trump administration cared about this uh, corruption in 2017 or 2018, when hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, aid went to the Ukrainians. It was only in 2019 when Joe Biden became the political front runner for the Democrats for the 2020 election. And since President Trump asks us to read the transcript, in the transcript of the July 25th call, the president doesn't actually mention corruption. He mentions the Bidens three times. And similarly, President Trump doesn't ask about Burisma, but about the Bidens. Now, other witnesses may have a lot more to talk about this, that we may learn evidence that the president was more concerned about corruption. Of course, as we've talked about on this channel before, there are proper channels for opening up an investigation into an American citizen abroad. And President Trump does not appear to have followed any of those procedures. And of course, those procedures never involve using your own personal attorney as a figurehead for American foreign policy. And also, as several witnesses testified, foreign policy and or the National Security Council is supposed to be very separate from domestic politics. So arguably it is correct that whatever Hunter Biden may or may not have done and whatever Joe Biden may or may not have done isn't relevant to the question of whether the president engaged in some illicit action. But what is relevant is the president's understanding of what Hunter and Joe Biden may or may not have done. And I think this is what Ben Shapiro was getting at in his tweet. He accurately points out that the president's motivations do matter in this context, that 
similar action can be liable or culpable depending on the mental state that's at issue. But at the same time, the process matters too, given how unusual some of these actions are and how bad some of them look. It can be very, very difficult to make a defense that the mental state is missing in this particular case. The process does matter. And you can't just put lipstick on a pig by saying that something that was uh, completely illegal and improper was done for the purpose of rooting out corruption. For example, as law professor Orrin Kerr said very facetiously, you can't impeach Nixon for trying to uncover corruption at the DNC's Watergate offices. It was Nixon's duty to fight corruption, and it's not his fault that his political opponents were so corrupt that it required him to send burglars over to break in. Some might counter that a president has better ways to fight corruption, such as sending the FBI, whose job it is to do that. But Nixon is so passionate about fighting corruption that he felt compelled to secretly send his own burglars, loyal only to him, to get it done right. It's disgusting that some think Nixon should be impeached simply for loving America so much that he just wanted to investigate corruption in the most effective way he could. You'd have to love corruption to criticize the Watergate break-in. It was a perfect break-in. That really gets to the heart of it. The process matters. And the process also gives us a window into the motivations that might have motivated the particular actions at issue here. Now, I think I'll have to do an entirely separate video on Hunter and Joe Biden and the potential for corruption. But suffice to say, both sides could be right at the same time. There could be underlying corruption, and it could also be the case that President Trump did something illegal and impeachable. Both could be true at the same time. Hunter Biden could be the devil incarnate, but President Trump's acts could still be an illegal solicitation of a bribe. They are not mutually exclusive, which is one of the reasons why I think a lot of the president's defenders will retreat to the position that it's bad, but it's not impeachably bad. This is a political question as to whether these actions give rise to impeachment or whether it is prudent to conduct an impeachment under the circumstances. It's a political question that I will leave to you, but also remember that the standard is not whether this is a crime or not, it is whether it is an abuse of power that is sufficient for impeachment or not. And all I'll say is that it might be a good time to read Federal 65 and 66 written by Alexander Hamilton, which gives a pretty good summary of why the founders gave Congress the power to impeach and when it's a good idea to impeach. Always a good idea to read the Federalist Papers. And then of course, everything else pretty much falls into the Chewbacca defense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Chewbacca. Now think about that for one minute. That does not make sense. Or in other words, as lawyers like to say, when you don't have the facts, pound the law, when you don't have the law, pound the facts, and when you don't have the law or the facts, pound the table. <laughs> The funny thing is that in my Twitter timeline, I am seeing both Democrats and Republicans using this phrase to describe the other side. So I will leave it to you as to whether you think that it is the Republicans who are using the Chewbacca defense or the Democrats who are using the Chewbacca defense. And of course, as Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And I would say that everything that is unfolding in this impeachment inquiry rhymes with the Nixon impeachment proceedings. And if you're not familiar with those impeachment hearings, you are missing a huge part of the story. Of course, the easiest way to get up to speed is to listen to some incredible books on Watergate and impeachment on Audible. I've actually been refreshing my memory about Watergate by listening to Impeachment in American History. It's a fantastic book in which four experts on American presidency review the only three impeachment cases from history against Andrew Johnson, Richard Nixon, and Bill Clinton, and explore the power and meaning of impeachment today. And you can also listen to Neil Katyal's audiobook, Impeach, The Case Against Donald Trump. Katyal wrote the independent counsel statute under which Robert Mueller was appointed and was the former acting solicitor general for the United States. So that book is absolutely incredible and gives you a window into the arguments for and against impeachment. And right now, Audible is giving legal eagles like you three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. That's more than half off the regular price. There's going to be a lot more impeachment news over the next three months, so it's a great time to get an Audible subscription and learn about the history of impeachment in the United States. All you have to do is go over to audible.com slash legal eagle, which you can click in the link below or text legal eagle to 500 500 and clicking on the link in the description really helps. So learn how these impeachment proceedings echo the past and how they're new on audible. Just head over to audible.com slash legal eagle, text legal eagle to 500 500 or click the link in the description. Do you agree with my analysis? Leave your objections in the comments and check out this playlist over here for all of my other other real law reviews, including all of my impeachment coverage, where I will see you in court.